So this is our uh, discipline specific presentations. We have three faculty who are going to talk about how they use LibreText in their discipline. And we are going to start with Brian Linshield, who teaches nutrition at Kansas State. Are you there, Brian? I see you somewhere. I'm here. Yeah. There you are. OK, the floor is yours. Yeah, let me get my browser open here. So you guys see LibreText now? Yes. OK. So um, my, my resource is one that originally I built in Google Docs, and then um, I've, I've worked to move it into LibreText, mostly being interested in the, the coming analytical sort of capacity that the DAP system is bringing. Because uh, I had it in another platform before and was able to do some research on the effectiveness of the assessments that are embedded within the resource. And so that's part of where my interest came in. So to give some sort of feel for what the resource looks like, I just pulled up one page to give uh, a feel for what the style of it is. Uh, so it has the H5P exercises that are embedded within it. The structure and style was to try to make sure that there wasn't too long of reading or too long of content without an assessment or some sort of multimedia or some sort of other sort of um, education, activity, engagement, those sorts of things. There's quite a few of the assessments. I have a number of uh, embedded videos where it fits within the content that they're learning. And so I'm scrolling. So big, big obviously emphasis on images and figures, you know, to help the students learn too. And so a number of uh, videos and things that are also embedded to help students reinforce, especially in this section, they're, they're fun videos like a glycolysis wrap, you know what I mean? And this TCA cycle one is, is fun too. You know what I mean, I guess, and things. And then uh, my favorite might be the Oxidator Love It. If you've not seen that one, I'd highly recommend, you know that one, I guess, and things as well. But um, those, those things my students really like. My nutrition students, um, I, I know we have some chemistry people here who love the chemistry. My nutrition students all, all love the chemistry. You know what I mean in things. And so part of what I'm trying to do is make it something that they feel like they can apply to and they find interesting in how they do that. And so a number of those um, different sort of things are within the structure of the, the course. And so as it's set right now, I, I can't see um, any sort of summative you know, piece as far as how they do on the assessments. But like I said before, I did have previously the capability in another platform to be able to do that and was able to look at some cool things, you know, which are in this article, you know what I mean, that I'm bringing up here quickly to show you some of. So this was the title of, of the article that we published here recently. So some of the things that we're able to look at within that platform that I'm hoping we will do within the DAP system too, let me make it not so big, is uh, we used a, uh, a histogram or you know a heat map here to look at how, how far in advance they were completing questions when they were assigned and things within the, those assessments within the book. And so able to see some interesting sort of categorization of procrastinators versus progressors and things within the different behavior we saw in students. Other things that we found there are somewhat interesting. Um, some of the things that was table is one of the major ones that we kind of focused on as far as our outcomes go. Mostly from the, the fact that you can see that question performance in the table is over here on the left side. And so you can see that the thing that I talked to my students about is try to get at least 80% of those questions correct. Cause you can see if they get 80% of those questions correct, their chance of success is pretty high. If they don't, you know what I mean? Then we start seeing that their chances of being successful are much lower and things. And so that's part of what I'm hopeful for the DAP system will be set up soon so that we can continue to develop some of this um, assessment capability and things that were built into the resource. So that's most of what I was planning to share. I have other things that you know I could share about um, my experience and things. It's uh, I don't know that it's groundbreaking. You know what I mean? In it's structure or style on LibreText itself. Um, I've seen a number of other resources that are set up in similar sorts of ways as mine. Uh, you know, my content sometimes is pretty old and it has to be updated sometimes because I I did previously first um, draft this in 
roughly 2010, I guess. And so um, that was when the first draft was done and it's just been revised and evolving since then. So I don't know if there's questions or things I can uh, answer. Um, Frank, can you tell everyone how long you've been um, using LibreText? Yes. Yeah. So I, I think we started in the summer, if I remember correctly. Uh, so we had a um, very close to deadline getting it in, you know, I mean, to the platform with some revisions with the H by fee exercises. So there was a version of LibreText that harvested a previous version of my resource. And that's how I even became the know about LibreText. And uh, so this newer version that has the H5P exercises, which they had to put quite a bit of time into developing and inserting is um, the, the one that we worked on quite a bit to get in place this summer. And so now we've done it this summer and now this fall, I'm utilizing it again. And so hopefully they continue moving forward. But the way my course structure goes is I teach it online in the summer and fall, but I have it online and on campus in the spring. And so I have a lot more students, I guess, in that semester uh, than what I do in other ones. And you have been soliciting student feedback, am I correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I've done some surveys and things to get feedback on previous versions. I haven't done it on the LibreText version since it's so new, um, but I'll, I'll have to do that. Like, I'm, I'm interested in, I do have, we have Canvas, I guess the other thing I should say is the LMS we have here. I am using the, the common cartridge to bring the chapters, you know, in the canvas. And I, I'm somewhat curious on whether students like, you know, using it in that way and when it's embedded within the learning management system or if they prefer the actual LibreText site. I, I know I, I had, a, I had a, a Zoom with some of my online students this morning and one of my students was pretty proud. Delmar, she held up a physical copy. You know, she, she ordered a physical copy and she was pretty proud. She's like, oh, I got my physical copy. You know what I mean of it and things. And so um, I, I know that, I don't think there's too many that are doing it, but she, she was pretty proud on holding it up, I guess, and things so I could see it. And so you used Google Docs before LibreText. Correct, and yeah. How many, do you, I forget, do you recall how many people have used your resource? Because I know you had it, you had it out there online, available for other people. Uh, there's been quite a few. It, it's fluctuated over time. The, the course is not um, as broadly utilized as like what a lower level nutrition course would be. Uh, my course is primarily sophomores and juniors. But I, some of the things that it was used in the past for is I know that the open course library that I think the Washington State uh, two-year schools built a number of years ago when they were trying to put together their nutrition resource at that time, I know that they utilized some of the content that was in here. Uh, there was a MOOC at one time that used it, uh, which there were so many people that were on it that um, it was like almost causing the Google Docs to crash. You know what I mean at that period of time? Because there were so many people that were on pages. And so um, that was one point in time. But as far as sustained use, I, I'm not sure. You know what I mean on how many people have adopted, you know, the resource to use, you know, themselves. I, I know there's people that, I know like the University of Hawaii, when they made their basic nutrition resource, told me that they were looking some at mine. You know what I mean, I guess, because it was at the time I did it, there was literally nothing out there in nutrition. And so um, now we're starting to get some lower level books, you know, our resources at least, so that we're starting to have a little bit more options available. But it's not, um, the nutrition field is not one where there's been a tremendous amount of uptake or interest compared to some other disciplinary fields. Great, thanks. Uh, anyone else have comment on besides me? <laughs> yeah. Can you comment on uh, sort of the upshot of the learning uh, analytics infrastructure that you or a study that you did and where you would like to go uh, if you had lots of information, which of course we are able to provide? Right. Yeah, so the thing I've talked to Delmar about is, you know, so I, I guess I should show, I showed you the structure here. So it's it's somewhat flat, you know what I mean? And they, they either uh, get the question correct or they don't get the question correct. And that's helpful because it can show them the response and understand why that is. 
But one of the things I talked about Delmar with what I understand the ADAPT infrastructure is going to make available is it, it could be possible to be able to make follow-up questions. You know what I mean? That either they missed it or another thing that my assessment style for exams is oftentimes the true, some true or false questions and they have to correct it if it's false. And um, with the H5P capability, I could have them not necessarily correct it, but I could say, is this true or false? If they say false, then it could be pull up another question and say, please highlight, you know what I mean? What is, what is false? You know what I mean in the statement? And so it could be higher level sort of learning versus them needing to, you know, take a 50-50 guess, you know what I mean, on, on, on the statement and things. And it would, it would prepare them better for the assessment style in the course, you know, I guess as well. I did a lot of since that's not available here and I know they're 50, 50, I did a lot more multiple choice in here. Uh, but part of the idea here is I did want the assessments to be ones that they can take fast. You know what I mean? I don't want them to have to be sitting there for a long time and writing something out, or I, I wanted them to be able to do it somewhat quickly, whether they're on their phone or whatever that might be so that they can complete the ass assessment fast. And I don't think that um, that sort of structure, which it seems like would be available at some point, would, would take that much longer for them, but it would fit with the assessment style and help prepare them for um, the assessments they're going to get on their understanding of the material. That's great. Um, certainly expanding the, the question uh, infrastructure to make it uh, adaptive, uh, depending upon what level of adaptive you want to do. Uh, it has a big impact on the educational mission that we have. Um, <clears throat> I guess the question that I had was more directed toward, you know, that heat map, for example, that oh, you showed. Yeah. Um, started to, to get information about how students interact with the uh, material uh, and the greater questions of efficacy uh, or formulations. What's the best formulation, for example, uh, or other hypotheses that are hypotheses that you may uh, be interested in. I'm just wondering if you have. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, so when we, yeah, when we, we did this work, we, we were partly interested in the, the students that, you know, didn't complete questions, you know what I mean, period, and then understanding of was that because they procrastinated and ran out of time, you know what I mean, or what, what was kind of the nature of, of why they didn't complete the assessments and things. And then also we were just curious to see if we could see patterns on, uh, and then I try the if I I try to be evidence based and hopefully my students appreciate that too. And so I try to communicate to them. You know what I mean. So I try to tell them. You know, I, the here here is uh, there's there's a page in uh, Canvas that provides some of the deep data that's in here to say you know here here's what we found. I suggest you try and to get or you should be shooting to try to get at least eighty percent of the questions correct. You know what I mean? Because here here's the students best result to be found. We don't have a as clear of a story, you know what I mean, with the the progressor um, procrastinator piece that's in the heat map here. I think it's going to take some more teasing out, you know, to understand a little bit more on this because I think uh, in theory it doesn't matter too much if somebody um, does complete the last question correct. But you know, part of what this is trying, and I guess I should explain the figure a little bit better. It shows. The first, middle, and last question of each chapter is what is what the heat map is showing, and so it shows you like how did they complete it early relative to the due date, or was it close to the due date? Is what the heat map is showing, and so I don't know that it matters too much if they complete that last question very close to the due date, but if they're completing all three questions very close to the due date, and say it's it's a it's a chapter that in theory they've been learning about for a week. Uh, that's probably not great, you know what I mean, for most students that they, they might not be reading or engaging with the material. I guess the other thing that I guess I can't add that I didn't really say there, that I feel like was pretty interesting from one of the results we got. Um, this is the percentage time that they said they spent answering questions. So they, they, they reported spending more time answering questions than they did reading you know, watching the videos within, you know, the resource itself. So they spent most of their time doing that. And um, so part of the, the benefit of the summative piece, I think is having some accountability so that they do spend that time. Cause I, I think there's some students that uh, without the summative aspect of it, don't, you know what I mean necessarily. And then they don't have the same sort of benefit on their learning and things that they would probably get if, if they were, you know, expected, you know what I mean, to uh, go through and complete those uh, assessments.
So in terms of your procrast procrastinators versus um, non-procrastinators, did you identify any uh, impact uh, on their performance? Uh, it might be a little difficult because your N is not super high to be able right. to resolve that, but. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if we specifically looked at that, you know what I mean, within our, our data that we had. I know that we, you know, we obviously looked at when they completed, but um, I'm trying to remember if we had, well, I mean, I guess we categorized them based off of what they were, you know what I mean? And then um, I think we had something to look at how they, so here, I guess this one, at least, well, that just tells you what they thought they were. I guess I'm trying to look and see if we did do that. I'm not sure that we did. You know what I mean? That's a good idea. You know what I mean? To look at how they would compare. I thought I remember uh, her working on that. And maybe I'm just not remembering and it's in there. You know what I mean? I guess, but because um, I remember talking about how they get a value that we could maybe use to, to do that, but maybe we didn't end up doing that or it didn't make the publication itself. Great. I apologize. I don't have a better answer. Thanks, Brian. Any other questions?